Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to finish reading Annie Dillard's Living Like Weasels, the main essay of our unit. We only have paragraphs 9 through 12 left, so let's go ahead and get started. What goes on in his brain the rest of the time? What does a weasel think about? He won't say, his journal is tracks in clay, a spray of feathers, mouse blood and bone, uncollected, unconnected, loose leaf and blown. So this paragraph is a really nice um, time to pause and talk about the fact that Annie Dillard is a pretty lyrical, <clears throat> excuse me, she's a pretty lyrical writer. Um, which means that sometimes, even though this is an essay, you'll notice that she's doing some internal rhyme, some words that sound good together, um, whether the, they have those long vowel sounds in common or they actually literally rhyme. So that last line that I read was kind of an example of that um, and something to keep an eye out for in the rest of this essay and just her writing style in general. It sounds good to the ear, you know. Um, moving on, still talking about this weasel, and finally moving into, you know, her central argument for this text, living like weasels, why do we care, what does she mean, right? <coughs> I would like to learn or remember how to live. I come to Holland's Pond not so much to learn how to live as frankly to forget about it. That is, I don't think I can learn from a wild animal how to live in particular. Shall I suck warm blood, hold my tail high, walk with my footprints precisely over the prints of my hands. But I might learn something of mindlessness, something of the purity of living in the physical sense and the dignity of living without bias or motive. The weasel lives in necessity and we live in choice, hating necessity and dying at the last ignobly at its talons. Okay, so here is sort of part, part of her central argument. Now she doesn't say it, straight up, literally, that just wouldn't be artful, you know, that wouldn't be uh, beautiful, good writing if she just said, you know, straight up what she meant. So it's a little bit more work for us, but we can kind of see the beauty of her language use, right? So she, she says that she might learn something of mindlessness. Um, we talked about the fact that she points out the weasel lives according to instinct, right? She said that, I think, in the first paragraph. That's what she means by mindlessness. Um, not thinking and overthinking and going back and forth the way that us humans tend to do, right? When we're making a decision, even if it's something basic, right? Um, so when she says mindlessness also, I think she means, even though it sounds like the opposite, mindfulness, right? Mindfulness, um, being present and immersed in the physical sensations and just the, the raw experience of each moment, right? So she's calling it mindlessness, but in our culture, we think of this type of living, this type of mindset as mindfulness, right? So that's something else that I think she's talking about here. Let's keep reading. Um, I would like to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should, and I suspect that for me the way is like the weasels, open to time and death, painlessly, painlessly noticing everything, remembering nothing, choosing the given with a fierce and pointed will. I missed my chance. I should have gone for the throat. I should have lunged for that streak of white under the weasel's chin and held on, held on through mud and into the wild rose, held on for a dearer life. We could live under the wild rose as weasels, mute and uncomprehending. I could very calmly go wild. I could live two days in the den, curled, leaning on mouse fur, sniffing bird bones, blinking, licking, breathing musk, my hair tangled in the roots of grasses. Down is a good place to go where the mind is single. Down is out, out of your ever loving mind and back to your careless senses. So yes, 
that is what she's talking about, that type of raw mindfulness of being in the moment without so much judgment, without so much mental chatter, guessing and second guessing and questioning everything and thinking about how other people will see your actions and judge you, right? So the weasel isn't concerned with those things. He has this single-minded mindedness. He trusts in his actions, in his instinct, doesn't doesn't second guess it right so she's kind of calling us to live more that way and she's saying she wishes that she could have lived more that way right mindfully um she talks about um retreating going down living in a little hole like a weasel literally no she's not like building a little bunker to go live in right um but this does kind of echo something that i think is growing again in popularity in western culture which is the idea of the spiritual retreat whether it's a Buddhist retreat, just a general mindfulness retreat. Um, maybe you've heard of these, but they're kind of like vacations. Um, some of them cost money, some of them are free. But the idea is that you go on retreat where you'll be given some kind of meditation guidance and you'll be spending most of that time in silence, just sort of watching how your mind works, the patterns that arise in your thoughts, and practicing this kind of mindful living. And the idea is that once you return from retreat, you're a more aware person and you're able to take some of those skills because it is a learned skill, just like a sport um, would be this mental training. It, it's a type of training. Um, and the idea is that it'll increase your well-being in your life once you return to the real world, right? So that's something that's gaining in popularity in Western culture. And it seems like she wants that kind of experience that's very reflective, spiritual, um, and maybe even life-changing, right? Okay, let's continue reading. We're um, still in paragraph 10 here, but it's the last page of text. Um, <clears throat> I remember muteness. Muteness means not talking. So that idea of retreat, not talking to anyone, right? I remember muteness as a prolonged and giddy fast where every moment is a feast of utterance received. Time and events are merely poured, unremarked, and ingested directly, like blood pulsed into my gut through a jugular vein. Could two live that way? Could two live under the wild rose and explore by the pond so that the smooth mind of each is as everywhere present to the other, and as received and as unchallenged as falling snow? So she brings up some um, points here that come up when people are discussing, you know, various lifestyles. Um, some people say, okay, nice, go on your retreat, but see see what you're like when you return. I bet you're, bet you're unchanged, bet you're the same, right? So she's kind of bringing that up. Can it work in the real world when you have more than one person, when you're called to be with other people again after your spiritual retreat? Can it really work? She seems optimistic. Um, in the next sentence, she says, I think uh, oh, no, she says, we could, you know, we could, we could do it. Um, so that's something that people bring up. And I'll just turn off. Um, in terms of this mindfulness retreat and like how likely is it to actually have an effect on your life, right? So she, she brings that up as well. Um, what else does she say that I wanted to talk about? Let's see. Um, how this idea of not speaking allows you to focus on the sensation of the moment. It's more raw, it's more real, it's it's more fulfilling, right? To live that way in silence sometimes, just going moment to moment. She says that living that way is like blood pulsed into my gut through a jugular vein. So your jugular vein is like your, um, I believe it's referring to the carotid artery that pumps the most amount of blood through your body. Um, and so it's like a direct life source, right? So she says, this type of experience gives me life, right? In that way, that's kind of the metaphor. Let's move on, we're almost done here. Um, paragraph 11, we could, you know, we can live any way we want. People take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, even of silence by choice. The thing is to stalk your calling in a certain skilled and supple way, to locate the most tender and live spot and plug into that pulse. This is yielding, not fighting. 
A weasel doesn't attack anything. A weasel lives as he's meant to, yielding at every moment to the perfect freedom of single necessity. So again, not second guessing. Um, when she says to stalk your calling, what does she mean by calling? You know, when I think of a calling, I think of, well, you know, what is your life's purpose? Perhaps you're turning that into a career, right? And, and maybe she doesn't mean it that way. But I think even more simply, like, just do the next thing. Just do the next step, you know? Um, it seems like, I'm sure for you too, with college apps and graduation, there's like so many little things that you have to do um, that it can seem overwhelming. She says, don't, don't overthink it. Just do the next thing, right? Instinct, instinct. Just do the next thing and you'll get through it, right? So I think that's another way to think of calling. Maybe it's not this monumental, you know, career or your life's purpose. Maybe it's just, what are you being called to do in this moment? What do you have to do? Engage with it fully, right? Be there for it. Enjoy it. That's your life, right? Um, and then move on to the next thing instinctually. Don't overthink it, right? So that idea again. Moving on, this is the last paragraph, guys. I think it would be well and proper and obedient and pure to grasp your one necessity and not let it go, to dangle from it limp wherever it takes you. So that's like that image that we saw at the very beginning of this piece of the weasel that was stuck onto, well, the, the eagle's neck, right? And then also the naturalist's hand to dangle from it limp and not let go. Just go for it, don't think about it, right? And then once you make that decision, stick with it, follow it through, see where it takes you. I think that's kind of what she means with this metaphor here. Um, don't go literally biting people, that's not what she's saying, right? Then even death, where you're going, no matter how you live, cannot you part. Seize it and let it seize you up aloft even till your eyes burn out and drop. Let your musky flesh fall off in shreds and let your very bones unhinge and scatter, loosened over fields, over fields and woods, lightly, thoughtless, from any height at all, from as high as eagles. So that's the end there. And I think that she's trying to say that when you make a commitment to live in a mindful way, um, where you're not judgmental about others or yourself, where you're just doing what seems like the next best thing and best in terms of the most moral, the most good, um, the most healthy for you or for your loved ones, right? That's how you're judging the next best thing. Don't overthink it though. Um, that when you live in that way, you end up with a life that has meaning, that's transcendent in a way, right? Um, that word transcendent, that's kind of what's happening at the end. Those images of you, you know, your purpose living on after you physically die or after your body decays or something like that, even though it sounds incredibly morbid, right? Um, but I think that's what she's saying. That's how you live a life of value, um, mindfully and with um, intention that's not so self-aware, so caught up in the ego, so caught up in what will other people think of me? Like, no, that's not how you should be going moment to moment, right? That doesn't serve you best. So I think that's like her main argument. When she says, let's live like weasels, she's not saying like, you know, because they're furry and cute. It's because they have this instinct, right? Um, that they live by, like all wild things. Um, and that that's something that we should try to do more of. Our mind gets in the way. To be a human is to probably be an overthinker. We have to live in communities. We have to get along with people. So of course we're concerned with that. Of course we think about it, but that it can actually cloud our judgment and make our lives less purposeful um, and maybe less fulfilling, right? So those are some of the main arguments that she seems to be making. And this reminds us that nature is a good place to turn to when we need some perspective on how to live, what our behavior should be like, but also in general, you know, a lot of um, motivation for living your best life, not taking anything for granted, being in the moment, having a sense of awe and gratitude for the opportunity to be alive. Um, a lot of that is grounded in nature 
going outside, looking at the night sky, looking at some images from NASA on their Instagram feed um, can be an awesome reality check. Remind myself, I'm sitting on a planet in space. This is the universe. That is all we know, right? It's pretty intense. That can really bring you back to reality, right? Um, so anyway, that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, that was our main essay, and I will touch base with you soon, either through this venue or another one. We'll be in touch. Keep checking Canvas. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye.